couple of weeks ago, I put out the call for people to ask me questions, and today I'm answering those questions. Questions about collage art, um, art in general, um, where I found inspiration, things about social media, organization, all of those things. So let's get to it. Hi, I'm Marguerite Miller, and if you are not familiar with me or, or what I do, I am a collage artist. Um, I am also a book arts enthusiast, and I did not always, or I did not start out as that. I was a technical writer for many years. I worked for IT companies, creating their user guides and um, technical manu manuals. Once I stayed home uh, with having children, my focus changed to being a parent, of course, um, but also I was looking for some new hobbies and some new interests that I could work on while being at home. So I turned to art and I discovered book arts. I discovered junk journaling and I discovered collage. And these things really changed my life. They changed my life because I enjoyed doing them so much. I found great joy in, in the time that I was, was creating. And um, I wanted to share that, that knowledge with other people to encourage them to take up collage art and to, to take up creating uh, journals things like that. What I discovered by doing collage is that I enjoy it a lot. And I want to encourage people to try it and to like the process of working in collage as well. So to that end, I created a couple of workbooks that provide assignments for people to do. Um, they are called Collage Weekly Planners. I have two volumes with 52 assignments in each one. Um, I've gotten a lot of good feedback that people are enjoying them, so I love that a lot. Uh, the other thing that I like to do is art exchanges. I do four through the year if everything is going well, um, because again, I want people to actually do and make not just um, not just watch others do it and think about doing it, but to actually do it. So these exchanges kind of motivate people to do it and to participate and get some art back in return. And um, yeah, that's what I like to do. So I have a list of questions that I received and I clustered them in groups according to you know, the questions, the type of questions they are. Some are general questions, some are very technical questions about collage and layout, and then other questions are about organization, and the last set is about social media. So I will start with the first group of general questions. Kathy Just Jen asks, my questions then are why, what, and how? Why does one create collage what do you do with it afterwards? And how do you bring your ideas together? The last part, how do, how do I bring my ideas together? I will talk about in the technical section. But for the first two, why does one create collage and what do you do with it afterwards? Why does anyone choose to do something creative? Why do people paint? Why do people um, color in coloring books? Um, why do anything creative? They do it because it brings you joy, um, it makes you feel good, and it's the same thing with collage. You can collage with a purpose, say that you have um, photographs of your family or documents from your family and you want to somehow put it together in some kind of journal um, or even a, on, a, on a canvas in the wall. That's with a purpose and you can do that certainly, but you can also just collage with scraps just because it's fun, it's engaging for your mind, it keeps you occupied and you enjoy it. Um, that's, that's the only reason uh, that you need is that you enjoy it. 
What do you do? What do you do with it afterwards? Um, it, I guess it depends on what it is. Uh, lots of times I, I do collage in, in journals, in junk or in glue books and junk journals. So I just, I save those. I, I have them on shelves. I do like the fact that I can fold something up and, and put it away with a book in a journal form. So that, that medium, I, I really do, I do like. Sabrina and Benji, how did you get started on your paper craft journey? How did you discover the craft and learn more, expand on your experience? And what did you do in terms of classes and learning? Did you do other kinds of art before and do you have formal education in art? No, no formal education in art. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in my introduction, I, I began with collage and paper arts um, after I started having kids. So I was already in my early 40s when I um, began just with, with paper crafts. Learn more and expand your experience. What did you do in terms of classes and learning? I, I guess the biggest learning took place from, from YouTube, um, just watching. You know, there are tons and tons of videos, particularly on junk journaling, not so much on collage, but on junk journaling. And I learned a lot from that. For collage, I learned the most from following people on Instagram and with Instagram, you know, you you scroll and you see lots of photos. There's some there's some videos of people actually collaging, but I, I actually prefer the photos, the still photos, because everything is stopped. You just look at the image and you absorb, you know, how the placement, just the look and feel. Um, so I learned a lot from from um, people that way, other artists that way. Okay, Tina says, what inspires you? Have you always been creative? And the next question from Jean says, what inspired your interest in vintage collage? So what inspires me is history. I love, and I always have um, been interested in history. I, I live in California. Um, California history interests me. Aviation history interests me. I volunteer at my local historical society. So yeah, that's that's always been that's always been big. Family history also also family history. And particularly in vintage collages, um, I guess also I have a, a, a love of paper. So when you combine history and paper, you get vintage papers and um, that's that's really great. The the thing that I also love about paper is that it's flat and again, you can fold it up or it's easy to store. You can put it away. You can have a lot of it and it's relatively, it just doesn't take up a lot of space is, is my point. <laughs> so I, I do like paper and I do like vintage things. Shelly says, what collage form speaks to you most? Do you enjoy making or collecting certain forms or sizes or sizes more than others? I don't really have a idea specifically what I could answer for collage form. Um, size, I, I do prefer postcard size, which is four inches by six inches. That seems to be kind of the sweet spot for me. If I go bigger, then I get a little anxious that I'm not, I have a lot of space that I need to fill. And if I go smaller, it kind of trips me up as well. So I've just gotten a kind of, I'm kind of really good with four by six or five by seven. That's, that's the spot. I wish I wish I could ask you, Shelly, a little bit, what do you mean by collage form? But anyway, another time. Kathy says, who are your favorite artists that inspire you the most in history and on YouTube? On YouTube, the person who inspired me, who, who gave me a lot of ideas and really um, lit a fire in me is uh, Debbie Ann Parent, who has her own business called Ephemera's Vintage Garden. She makes digital printable kits. And I used to use those a lot for creating junk journals. But she shows you her junk journals in her videos. 
and, um, you know, gives you ideas or gave me ideas of, of how to do things. And um, she, that was huge. That was really, really big. And she also has a Facebook group where a lot of people post their junk journal photos and collage art. And uh, that also was a big influence on me. The other person I wanted to mention is um, on Instagram. Her name is Pamela Arts in SF. She has always, she does a lot of mail art, which I love correspondence art and collage in general. So she's been a big, a big influence on me as well. Assuming you sell your creations, how do you come up with the prices? Donna H asks. I don't sell my creations so much. I don't sell my junk journals. I don't sell individual collages, uh, but I have sold a, one junk journal in the past. And I know that for pricing, you, what you have to do is basically go online and see what other people are selling their junk journals for. The best place for that would be Etsy. I would recommend going on Etsy and just doing a search for, for whatever type of art you're trying to sell and see what other artists are selling theirs at. Andrea says, actually, I would love to learn about copyright issues when using collage material for personal use, but also in case I want to sell some of my collages. Andrea wins the award for most complicated question. <laughs> um, this is a very big topic um, and I'm not an expert because I'm not a lawyer. And I know that each country has their own laws for copyright. So again, um, what's, what's valid in the United States might be different in Canada or different, you know, different countries. I do use images that have copyright on them. Um, and I'm aware of it. Most of the time when I create things are for myself. Um, and so I, I don't care if, if I, I use um, something that is copyright, copyrighted. If I had the intention to sell something, your art should be considered fair use. Um, the materials you use are fair use. What that means is that you need to be aware of how you are using those, those pieces of illustration or paper in your art. For example, if you have a, um, an ad not an ad. If you if you're using something that has a copyright on it, you obviously cannot use the whole piece. You can just use a portion of it or use it, but then have it layered um, with something on top. So so for example, if you create a collage and then you have something that you are putting on, you know, if you have it on the very top, um, that's probably not going to work. And I, I have an example. Here is a collage I made, and I used this Hendrix gin label. So this is this is for me. This is not something that I would try and sell. The label is pretty much 100% visible. There's just a tiny little bit where it, you know, overlaps, but that's that's hardly anything. So um, this would not be a good example of something that you could sell. Here's another example. Same thing. I used a wine label and um, pretty much the whole thing is visible. So this is in my personal journal. This is a collage that, that I create, but this is not something that I could sell. There are guidelines that you, that you can follow for, for copyright in collage. I know that um, when these things do go to court, they are, they are judged on a case-by-case -case, um, basis. So there's unfortunately no clear list of, of things that you can or cannot do. Um, there are some images that after a certain point become part of public domain unless they're recopyrighted. Um, I believe something like from the early 1920s, older than that, um, it's fair use. You can use them, but it depends on the, on the image. Obviously, you know, Coca-Cola has been around longer than 1920 and yet you know, the copyright has been renewed. So you have to be careful with things like that. But yeah, I would say, I would say the internet has, has got the best information for you for, for copyright information. So the next group of questions are technical. The first two questions are about glue. 
Mamma Mia says, I've asked this before, but I'm thinking it may help others. What is your preferred way, tool, glue, or both, to adhere your ephemera to projects? Does this choice differ as to what type of medium it's going on? What special tools do you positively need or use when working on a project? And lastly, what's your opinion of digital collage? This last part, um, I will take that as a separate question and address that later because the second question is also regarding glue. Uh, it's the glue and sealing and all, water-based or not, that troubles me. I like the finished product archivable. I'm working on family history collages. I'm trying a spray varnish soon for both water-based and not. Can you revisit your gluing and do you permanently seal your art? Thank you. Okay, glue. What is my preferred way to glue? For general purposes, general collage that's just casual, fun, not, I'm not using any special pieces of ephemera, just, I don't know, um, newspaper or magazine pictures. I just use glue stick. Does my choice differ depending on what medium um, it's going on? Absolutely. If I am gluing on top of something that has a glossy finish, like a playing card, for example, then I use double-sided tape. That's very sticky and I find that it works entirely better than using glue on a, on a slick surface. So I use double-sided tape. Um, I also use double-sided tape on things that are thicker. So um, a photograph, for example, I will use double-sided tape. Now, for things that are archival, that I, that I want to, to archive, I have a couple of suggestions. So I'm going to show you some examples. My first example is a painting. Well, it's not a painting. It's a, it's a, it's a canvas. It's a collage on a canvas and it is a bunch of papers and postcards, pictures that um, I did for, um, with the theme of Czechoslovakia. My husband's from Slovakia and I, I put it together using a bunch of different documents from his family and things like that. I used originals on this piece and I did not put a varnish over the top. I did not because I wanted to to have the papers in their most original form and their in their in their natural state without any varnish on top so that is is one example my second example is this um this piece of art i made using a bunch of recipes that belong to my grandmother um i collaged them and had them Put a, put a frame around it. And then when I wanted to preserve it, I thought about varnish, but then I liked the idea of using glass over, over the top. So that is what I did with this one. My third example is another canvas piece I did, collage. And these are images um, that I gathered and um, used with with the theme of Vienna, the city of Vienna. I these these papers are all uh, copies and reproductions. So I did not use any original pieces in in the in this collage. I glued them to the canvas with matte medium, and then when the when everything was dry, it dried flat and I did use a varnish over the top. I used this Liquitex satin varnish and I did not want it to be shiny, but this varnish, it gives it a little bit of a sheen, but not, not very much. And I was, I was happy with the result. Would I use this varnish over the papers on my Czechoslovak project? No, I would not because this varnish will soak into the paper and it's gonna completely change the look of the paper and I wanted to avoid that. So in general, I would say if you want to preserve um, something that is um, important with special papers and such, I would put it under glass. That's, that's my recommendation. 
If you are doing it in an album or somewhere smaller, then I would not put a varnish over the top because the act of closing it and keeping it out of the light is, is, is going to preserve it. So I think um, that would be sufficient. But you can just see what other artists have done and ask that question to them as well and see, um, see what they say. Okay, um, oh, that last question about what is my opinion of digital collage. I like digital collage. I'm not very good at it yet. Um, so it's something that I'd like to work on more. My version of digital collage right now is to, to do a regular collage and then scan it and it becomes digital. Um, but as far as layering images in, pro in, in things like Photoshop, I, I'm not very good at it. So it's something that I'll have to work on for sure. Denise says, my collages are decent up to index card size. Any larger and they look like things have just been thrown on. Any tips or tricks to make them more cohesive would be appreciated. I have this problem as well. As I mentioned earlier, my, my favorite size is about four by six. Once I start to get bigger than that, I, it, it, I get really discombobulated and I, I start, to, start to feel a little bit more anxious, like, oh, this is not working. And then smaller, I'm okay with smaller. That's also a challenge. The thing is with, with the sizes is that I feel like the bigger the page, the bigger pieces of, of um, illustrations and, and, and papers I use on that page. So I use small pieces for smaller size and then larger piece, pieces for bigger. So that has kind of worked for me. That's, that's probably the, the, best, the best thing that, that I can recommend. When you sit down to do your collage art, how do you decide what to work on and what pieces of ephemera to use? So this, this changes. Sometimes I have a glue book, specific, glue book, like for example, right now I have an eclectic page glue book that I'm working in. This is, I have a bunch of pa blank pages that I want to add to. So that's the book that I want to work in. So sometimes it's the glue book and then other times it's a piece of ephemera that I, that I find. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to use this or a wine label or, you know, something specific where I have that first piece and then I'm going to be adding others onto it. So that is, you know, it depends. That's, those are my, my two um, scenarios. So what pieces of ephemera to use? Yeah, sometimes there's something very specific. And then once I have that first piece, I will begin to add others that complement that first piece. My most go-to example is uh, postage stamps. I use postage stamps a lot when I'm trying to highlight um, highlight another piece of, of, of illustration that is that is in. So I have that example that I showed you with the wine label. Let me let me find it again. Well I have a different one because I can't find that one. So this wine label it has a very very unique um, illustration with this purple color in it. And so I began looking for postage stamps that would complement it. And I found these two, they are, it's the same stamp, just in different denominations. The, the colors are two shades of purple and they perfectly match the two shades of purple that are on this wine label. So once I have things like that, then it kind of, the pieces come together for me. Those are the kinds of like pairs or relationships. I guess that's the better word. Relationships between images, between pieces. If I can find a combination of, of pieces that I know are gonna look good in a collage, then that's my foundation for building. How do you know when your collage is done? When to stop adding. <laughs> One thing I have learned that's really important is that when you are considering how to build a collage, there are certain things that you need. You need a substrate, which is something that you put your papers onto. 
you need papers, you need glue, and you also need time. Time is a factor that is part of your collage and people don't take this into consideration often enough. People want to start something, they want to work on it, they want to finish it, and they want to move on to something else. And with collage, that does not work. Or of course it works, but you will just be a happier person if you realize that time is one of the ingredients that you need to make a good collage. So how do you know when it's done is you let something rest and you come back to it. Sometimes that rest period is 10 minutes or half an hour or half a day. Sometimes it's one day or two day or three days. It depends on the project that you're working on and um, you know how much time you want to devote to it. So I often will lay things out and then walk away, go away. And if, if I'm really attached to making this collage work, I sometimes spend a week making a single collage. And I, it's not, not all the time, but if I really love the pieces that I have, if I, if I have some really beautiful picture or, or a combination of things that I really want to work, then I will be patient. I will use the time to, to devote to making it work. That's the best way to put it. So sometimes I, I and, and I always leave the option open to come back to it. Even sometimes years later, I will, I will come back and I will add something. So you stop when you are comfortable stopping and then just tell yourself, you know what, if I wanna add something back, if I wanna look over it again in a month and, and see if there's something that I can add, then it's okay to do that. Right. Let me let me see if I can find another example. I was just looking over this um, this collage here, um, and I see some spots that I could put something, put something else over there. Look, I have this long empty space over here. Um, so I am open to the fact that I can come back and add something to this collage. Hollis says, what constitutes a focal point? It sounds like it is the image the eye travels to first or is most prominent, but what makes it that way? Is it size, is it color, is it location on the page, whether it's a person, place, or thing, all of the above? Does it need to be the topmost layer and not tucked under any other papers at that point? I know when I've been successful, even if accidentally, in establishing a focal point, but other times my page just seems to be an assemblage of things of equal value. Wow, Hollis, you got it right. You hit the nail on the head with this one. Sometimes there's a focal point and sometimes there seems to be an assemblage of things of equal value. That is exactly right. And those are two different types of collages. So one is not better than the other. They are simply two types. Sometimes you have a clear focal point. You know exactly what your eye should go to. Other times it's just, it's the whole composition that is your collage, right? So don't think that you need to have a focal point because you don't. You just, sometimes it's one way and sometimes it's the other way. Or if you want to specifically have a focal point, then that's perfectly fine. Now, is it size, color, location on the page? If you choose to have a focal point, then probably yes. It can be all of those things or it could just be one of those things, right? A person, place, or thing, it doesn't matter what your focal point is. Um, it could be just something that's very colorful. I have this example of this. I mean, look at the focal point. It's it's a huge block of, of postage stamps in this bright orange or bright purple color. So that's my focal point. It's not it's not where it's positioned. It's just probably the size and the color. Rachel C says, "How can I move to the next phase in collage? I'm still stuck in neutrals, text, sheet music, lightly patterned paper." I see your master boards with pictures, colors, patterns, and when I do it seems, when I do it, it seems clunky or busy. I'm still stuck in neutrals, text, music sheets, and a lightly patterned paper. 
I am too. I am really stuck in neutrals, um, but that's the place where I want to be stuck. I love neutrals. I love the slight variances in colors in neutrals and playing off of that. So I don't think it's a bad thing to be stuck in neutrals. Um, if you want to add more color, then choose something, you know, as you look through your papers, something that stands out to you with color that you can add on top of your neutrals. The only way to, to feel more confident with what you're doing is, is to practice more and to do more. So um, experiment with the colors that you like in combination with neutrals and experimenting with experiment with doing something bold um, if you'd like. The next question is also about color. Do you think about your colors? How many different colors would you use on a piece? Do you usually use a focal color? I suppose I do. And let me see if I can find another example. So here is a collage with a purple color as probably the dominant color on this, this page. I have some neutrals um, and then I've got that really loud um, business envelope um, pattern back there. But purple is, is the color that I tried to, to have stand out. How many colors would I use in a piece? Probably two, maximum three. Um, and that is in addition to, to the neutrals. So in that example I showed you, I have blue and I have purple and also a little bit of green. It just depends on how, how loud and how busy you, you like your collages or if you want them to be kind of muted. Um, it's just a preference. And again, the only thing that you can do is to just keep on creating and seeing what you like to do. I do sometimes push myself to use more color and sometimes I feel like I'm a little uncomfortable with that. So it's something that I need to do more of, but it's it's just personal preference. Nichelle says, in your video on creating a glue book, you show index cards on a ring. Your cards look more oblong than standard index card. What are their dimensions? Can you sh player, sh please share? So let me show you what this is. This is my set of index cards and they are three and a half by six and a quarter. So these cards, they are index cards and I tend to do them in sets. Let me show you. So here is what one set looks like. The theme I have here are photos vintage photos, and then I also have some red that I share across both sides. I do two cards at one time, sitting pretty much just like this, and that way I can kind of make these two collages cohesive. Let me show you another example. This one kind of has a blue theme, a little bit of yellow, And I'll show you one more. This one. This one has a pink magenta color that is shared between the two. I also use postcards on both sides. And I also use these um, illustrations of buildings. So yep, yeah, it's just a one, one set or one style of, of creating a collection of collages. Um, I, do, I do like to work in this little book. Okay, next set of questions is regarding organization. <laughs> How do you store your ephemera? Um, I have two questions, Angela Art and Linda. Linda asks, what kind of storage system do you have for all of your ephemera? I guess I have to show you my workspace. My workspace is in my laundry room, which is not a very attractive location, but I will give you a little tour. Here is my office. <laughs> it is um, a counter in my laundry room area. 
So I stand to work and behind this door, well, through that space there is my kitchen, but behind this door is a shelf that I have a lot of supplies on. And then I have my desk where I, I work. So here on my desk, you can see that I have these, um, these just nesting boxes, basically. This is where I put all of my papers. Not all of my papers, but a, a big chunk of them are here. And I like to have them separated by size. That's pretty much the main criteria for what goes in these boxes is size. So, um, well, the only thing that I don't have in here are postage stamps, I keep those separate. But I will put everything else, I put photos, I put postcards, I put papers in these nested boxes. Up in the cabinets, I have some vintage ephemera that are very small pieces. I keep them in this, these, this pen, pen pencil separator thing that, that goes typically inside of your desk. Um, I use that to stick all of my vintage, um, my small vintage pieces. So these, these pieces of paper are from 1945 or older. And then also I have some vintage postcards up here. I have um, postage stamps. I have my photos. Um, and I, the photos I just keep in a, like a plastic bag and I go through them when I need photos for what I'm looking for photos for, for a collage. So this is, this is my, my cabinet space where I, I kind of keep those. I also have some larger pieces of paper that don't fit into the nested boxes and I keep those in the cabinets below. Um, but I, I don't have too many, um, too many of those large pieces. In the cabinets below, I also keep um, my the mail art that I receive. So those are down there. And then my other supplies like additional glue and um, I don't know, napkins, rolls of tape, double-sided tape, all, all those things, tools, basically, just tools down there. So that's how I store my ephemera. The last two questions are about social media, uh, Instagram and YouTube. So Gay says, um, Instagram confuses me. Should I do reels or post individual photos or videos? How do I use those hashtags? If I make something inspired by you, do I hashtag and then your name? To tag someone, like when you create a collage um, and post it on Instagram, you use the at symbol to tag a person. You use the hashtags for topics. Um, and you should definitely use hashtags if you want to gain some traction on Instagram and you want um, people to find you. Um, recommended is somewhere between nine and 30 hashtags. And I know that seems like a lot, but you know you can do things that are around your subject matter, whatever you're doing. So if you're doing collage, you can do collage art. You could do collage artist, hashtag vintage collage, hashtag vintage collage art ephemera, and then collage journaling, collage art journaling, collage, um, just keep on going, keep on going. And you can always see what other people, what other hashtags people are using on the art that you like. That's another important thing to do. So yes, hashtags are very, um, they're important when you want people to find you. Um, reels and videos, it's it depends. I can say that Instagram is pushing very heavily on reels because they want to compete with TikTok. That's unfortunate because that is not what I want. And a lot of other users who share their art are not interested in doing videos or reels um, because, you know, art is kind of still, it's quiet. It's like if you go to a museum, you don't want to be bombarded with images. You want to enjoy, you know, something that you see um, and absorb it in your own time without having to be forced to pay attention to something that's happening in front of your eyes, right? It's a personal choice 
Um, but Instagram is pushing reels very much. If you're trying to gain traction, then yes, you should definitely do videos and do reels. But I guess try and um, balance it between that and still photos. I prefer still photos. A lot of artists prefer still photos. That's something to keep in mind. Last question. Any advice for getting started on YouTube? Yes. Again, you have to think about whether you are interested in doing it as a hobby or as a business. Approach for those things are separate depending on what your interest is. You, If you're interested in growing your YouTube channel, then you kind of need to be consistent and you need to be putting out content. How much content? It depends on how quickly you wanna grow and how you want people to find you. If you're a little more serious about it, then you should be thinking about one video every week or one video every two week and just consistently put them out for a couple of years. That's how you grow on YouTube. YouTube is not an overnight thing. So yeah, if you are just doing for fun, just for hobby, then do whatever you want. Do post as, as many times as you want and, and make videos of the things that you want. If you're trying to grow as a business, then you need to figure out who's your audience and you need to figure out um, what kinds of things they need where are their pain points? What do they need help with? And then you create those kinds of videos addressing that. So um, yeah, it depends. <laughs> all right, thank you everybody for all of your questions. Um, I appreciate them. I appreciate um, your attention in following and commenting on, on all the videos. Um, this is, it's such fun to be able to share this love of collage art and paper arts. And yeah, let's let's keep on doing it. So thanks for watching and I will see you the next time.